Welcome, Mateo, and company, and uh, welcome to High on Spirit, you guys. This is a very cool addition. Today we have Mateo, who is a chocolatero, who learned his skill down in the bush in Peru, growing and farming cacao and other medicinal medicines. And uh, he's here to teach us and talk to us about the making of the chocolate and also a lot of its benefits, as well as some other cool wisdom I'm sure we're going to get to... Uh, you know, extract from this and this. So go ahead and uh, say hello to the to the gang. Yeah, man. thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here and uh, good to reunite again, Dylan. I haven't seen you in a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So grew up in the Boston area. Didn't really think I was ever gonna be working on farms in the jungle of Peru, but after college. Uh, a couple of circuitous routes through uh, working on farms in Oregon and Washington, woofing, kind of opened up my mind and my heart to other possibilities. So then I just took off and spent six months woofing in Peru and ended up landing. After what do you mean by that, woofing? Woofing, yeah, right. Um, worldwide opportunities on organic farms. It's kind of a network of farms that accept volunteers. So you just contact the farm say I want to stay a day or a month, they have different guidelines, totally different farms, different styles, and then you can make an arrangement, stay there, usually free food, place to stay, and exchange, learn a lot of, you know. Oh wow, that's very cool. I'm sure people are going to be very yeah, interested to check that check out. out I yeah. Definitely something that altered the course of my life, having that opportunity to just learn directly, which is what my life wasn't like for a long time, be not having self-directed learning, kind of going to school, sitting down, being taught what I should know, according to who knows. <laughs> and so, <laughs> yeah, and according to at who? At that point, That's after true. graduating college, I was like, you know what? I want to just take the next four years and just learn whatever I want to learn, whatever feels right. And so the woofing kind of opened that up. That's cool. So many of our youth today don't they don't really have that. It's like they they get out of college and it's like what now? And they either sit and flounder oftentimes or like, you know, they end up getting into something that they're not 100% really feeling, you know, because they're just part of the machine now. So that's really cool that you took that time. I wish more of uh of yeah. us would would have done that when we were younger. Uh once I'm going to fix it. Yeah, so I ended up whooping on a farm in the actually the first place I landed to it was a, a an eco village on the coast, really beautiful place. I was there a month, and then I ended up meeting someone who had just purchased a farm in the jungle. And after a couple months working on other farms, we had a an encuentro on his land, basically a workshop, weekend workshop, all about food forestry. So people came from all around. It was deep in the jungle. the The ride was in the back of a giant giant truck that had a uh, pallets and pallets of stuff, a cement mixer, and probably about 40 people stuffed in the back of it. We left at 11, 11 p.m. We probably didn't arrive till like 2 p.m. the next day. <laughs> it was wild, but uncovered the tarp after like 10 hours tarped up, can't see anything moving around. And there you see the jungle just laid out before you. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. Wow. And just been there and rolling hills. This is what they call Ceja de Selva. Ceja de Selva, the eyebrow of the jungle. Just just east of the Andes or just down river from the Andes sloping into that Amazon jungle that eventually you keep going eastward and then you get lowland jungle, you know, that's where Adam and Beja and you've been down to there. That's yeah. flatland, lowland jungle. I love that, the area where it's still kind of cloud foresty. Yeah. 
yeah, you grow so much in different ecosystems yeah. there. So the classic crops there was coffee is kind of for the highlands, and then cacao is for the lowlands, and then they grow bananas grow everywhere there, you know, in both of the ecosystems, and then all these other different tropical crops throughout there. So this Ceja de Selva zone that I landed in was called Okobamba, and um, ended up spending three months there just living in the jungle and then kind of directing other volunteers and we were harvesting coffee and there's a decent amount of bananas and you know just chopping down a banana tree harvesting bananas that was like coming from the place of I don't even know how bananas grow or how they get here and then you're holding the big racimo with like 200 bananas on it yeah and you probably got some really good varieties down there that we don't even see up here ever absolutely yeah it's one of the things that uh I, whenever I get a chance to go a little further into town, they have a grocery store in Waterville, about, you know, half hour away, that's, uh, that's got the red bananas. Yeah. And I really like those. Yeah, those are great. Creamy and like, yeah. So many varieties. I mean, basically the only one you can buy in stores is Musa Cavendish, mm -hmm. which is one specific type of banana. And it's actually genetically identical to every single banana in the world. They, they reproduce via the, the stem and they keep growing up roots and you get so that one type of banana was found and now it's planted all over and as far as people in the west know that's that's what bananas are and like that's it you know yeah so yeah yeah our parents used to eat a you were spoiled banana. yeah so you got all sorts of different <laughs> types of bananas it's great and um yeah that farm i it was just past the cacao growing season but the neighbor had a big orchard, so we, f we found like the last couple pods. I'd never seen chocolate, how it grows, and the pod right off the trunk of the tree. These colorful pods. And we got to try some of the cacao fruit, kind of at the end of the harvest. And um, ended up playing soccer with these guys. And um, they were like, I was, you know, you can come over to the farm whenever you want, check it out. So they ended up coming the next day in their motorcycle, pulling up to the farm I was staying at. And they brought me a bag of cacao beans and this little jar of fresh honey that they had just harvested from the land. And mm. they were the ones who really first taught me what, how, what is cacao and how to process it. And so they brought the beans, they showed us, they showed me you know, where, where they came from, how you, cut, how you peel them open, and we roasted them on a stove in these clay pots they call kanaya, just rice right over the stove, and then um, peeled them and we grinded them into the pure 100% cacao mm. that we drink. And mostly we'd always drink it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. It was the first kind of introduction into the world of chocolate and cacao. But now you actually make the bars now as well, and you have a company that does that. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, so I started Prophecy Chocolate in 2019, and I'd been working with some of the farmers down there importing the cacao to the States, and I decided to make the chocolate bars myself. And so I've been doing that for a couple of years now, and really with the vision of connecting the cacao with all these other amazing plants that we have and mushrooms that we have growing maybe right around our backyard right here in Maine too, you know. So the whole idea is to bring that element of medicine, medicinal plants from the north and bring and infuse it with the cacao so that people, everyone's going to eat chocolate, you know, everyone likes chocolate, but you infuse it in some other plant or mushroom intelligence that's growing around them that they've never had before and it's more likely they're going to bring that in and, and, and be able to enjoy it. You know, it's got to taste delicious too. So. Well, there's a tremendous synergy that's going on there, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dylan and I had the opportunity to sample some of that chocolate. And let me tell you, I had the, the one with the, uh, that had some flowers in it and you could see the flowers like right in the chocolate. That was sublime. Yeah, man. So... Very, very good stuff. Tell, tell us like just a little bit about, you know, what are some of the differences like when you get a handcrafted chocolate like that versus this like, you know, stuff that most people are familiar with that they buy in the stores? Yeah, there's so many factors that go into it really. So I guess you have to start with the plant that it's coming from because not the factory plant, yeah. but like, you know, the actual plant that it's coming from. And so there's all these different varieties of cacao. Just like there are apples, you know. Just like bananas. Just like bananas, absolutely. <laughs> and so the variety of cacao might have the most to do with that flavor differential and the difference of, of quality because there are very few kind of heirloom cacao varieties left. 
Now, most of the cacao in the world is planted in a nursery and then is, is, is grafted on from basically the, the cuttings of one specific variety tree, like CCN51 is, is one of these clones that now is probably, you know, half the cacao in the world comes from one of these clones, you know. And so I think it's maybe something like 95 or 98 percent of the cacao in the world is sort of a hybridized cacao that's been selected for production but not necessarily quality. And so most of the cacao in the world that you get, most of the chocolate is going to be from a high yielding variety that's not necessarily high tasting. You know, it doesn't yeah, taste great. Yeah, or great. high in phytochemicals and nutrients and all that good stuff. Right. So pretty much all throughout the Americas, from Mexico down to Bolivia, you have each country has their own amazing heirloom cacao varieties. And I just happened to land in Ocobamba in, in southern Peru in the Cusco region. And the cacao that they have there is called cacao chuncho. And chuncho means native in the, in the Quechua language. And the cacao came from deeper in the jungle from different tribes, I mean Machiganga and the Pirus tribe. And so the cacao was then kind of exchanged and traded and moved by humans, by animals. It's a delicious fruit, so the animals eat them a lot and then scatter the seeds and just come up. And this, this chuncho cacao is just happens to be one of the most special heirloom cacaos in the in the world I and mean, there's amazing ones everywhere really but there's something special about the chuncho because of the genetic diversity within the family of chuncho cacao um, there's maybe they're just starting to understand how many kind of sub varietals there are within that family of chuncho all different sizes pods and beans and you have beans that look triangular you have tiny tiny beans like you know, these these beans, they're so small in a commercial sense that they're actually, you know, before specialty chocolate and small craft chocolate makers, these would probably be worth less. Which is why a lot of the farmers that used to grow chuncho cacao, it's like our native cacao in that mm -hmm. region, were told by these agronomists that were probably sent by state-run agencies and USAID, well, don't grow that variety. It's small. It doesn't produce a lot grow this new improved variety. So most of the chunco, chuncho cacao is coming from older plantations too because a lot of the in the last 20 years most people were only planting this air, this kind of hybridized cacao and now they're starting to get an appreciation back for the chuncho because craft chocolate makers around the world are asking for it. They want the high quality bean and then the people growing it are starting to reconnect with the with the beauty of the cacao as something beyond just a cash crop because for them it was mostly just a cash crop for maybe 50 or 100 years and they didn't really have the they, the culture was a little different in terms of they started to value less like the quality of the of the product that they're producing and thus hopefully feeding to their families with trying to support themselves economically. And they were told the answer is kind of planting these other varietals. Which is something I think is important. A lot of the farmers, they have chuncho cacao and then they have the, air, uh, the more uh, hybridized varieties. Sure. And the hybrid varieties will produce all year. The chuncho will only produce maybe four months. Okay. Well, you know, it's interesting. That's very good that the, uh, that the people have spoken to a degree and like this demand for high quality chocolate has brought about a demand for this, you know, for the craft beans, which is awesome because, you know, like too often in industrial society, we take a good thing, you know, uh, something that's a great idea, and, but then we overdo it until it's become a really, really bad idea, mm -hmm. you know? So being able to produce massive amounts of chocolate is a good idea, but then when it's at the cost of everything else and the biodiversity, you know, and then we're left with what? We're left with no uh, choice, really, no, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I and mean, you hit the nail on the head of the other major issue, which is kind of the elephant in the room for a lot of the tropical crops and cacao specifically along with coffee is is that deforestation and and what does it really take to have everyone in the world eat a chocolate bar every day? You know, how much land does that need to open up to grow cacao and how are we growing that cacao? Cuz if we're going to grow it in a monoculture, then we're going to sacrifice biodiversity 
vibrancy of communities and we're ultimately we're sacrificing our future in yeah. our future in our future of eating chocolate because if you just keep growing cacao in this specific way then it's not going to become something that's special and it becomes a lot more susceptible to all these diseases and you know getting wiped out sure one thing can wipe them out whereas these heirloom varieties have stood the test of time yeah yeah mm -hmm. very cool well you want to try one of the beans i would love to so yeah these are just little chuncho cacaos this is safe i'm assuming you're fully vaccinated <laughs> just kidding the jungle vaccine <laughs> <laughs> what are you tasting that one? It's nutty. I like the flavor. Mm. Mm. It's just like the right amount of bitter. Just thinking about the skin, how so much of it is like disregarded in most of the chocolate process. 15% the aromine in times in the skin. Mm. A lot of the andamines there. Once it's fermented, then the phytic acid isn't a problem any longer. Yeah. Mm. Like, it's kind of like leathering, so feel the, mm. the remaining like chocolate fruit yeah. the outside of the bean. Yeah, I've had uh, cacao beans from one of the farmers I work with, Ephraim, and they always do different processes because, like you're saying, the cacao is fermented. So once you grow the cacao, let's say you have whatever variety, you get these big pods, cut them open, and inside is fruit surrounding seeds. And that will end up being processed. Most of the cacao is just dried right away. And so that's going to lead to something that's really bitter and astringent. And so overly bitter and astringent, most of the cacao is going to be like that. So to counteract that, you roast it at high degrees, you add lots of sugar, you add lots of other ingredients and emulsifiers to make it kind of palatable. But the high quality cacao is fermented and then dried. And so this farmer, Ephraim, was experimenting with different methods, different days of fermentation and drying. And he found that with the chuncho cacao, it's, the seeds are smaller, so you don't necessarily need to ferment it as long. But with just like a three day ferment and then dry it right away, with a lot of, you know, good amount of heat the first few days with the sun, that he's actually able to capture a lot of the sweetness mm. on the, on the, skin of the cacao and you pop it in it almost has like a jolly rancher type flavor yeah mm. and so yeah you're you're roasting in you're peeling them off you're gonna lose that flavor too and the nuance and what temperatures does it get up to do you know with the fermentation yeah yeah it kind of depends they say like the benchmark is you want to get it up to 45 degrees celsius which is so, what yeah exactly <laughs> no i think it's like a hundred and um let's see yeah 110 or so around there 112 so it gets pretty hot yeah and it yeah, can get up higher even yeah some people like it up around 125 and then the raw food is people get all fanatical and say it should be turned every six hours or something so it doesn't get over 105 yeah i mean it seems to me like the activity and the aliveness of the fermentation mm -hmm. i don't think it really matters how high that that temperature gets mm -hmm. um but, yeah, it's, you know, you'd have to get it really nice and cooking to get it up to that temperature. I, I would say most of the cacao that's fermented doesn't even get quite that hot. Hmm. And, um, yeah, the key is to get it hot enough. Because yeah. that's a lot of times that happens when I, in Okobamba when I first got there. I tried to process the cacao mm -hmm. myself. And, and most of them, they were just, the farmers I learned with, my friends, they were just fermenting it in bags for a couple mm -hmm. of days and then drying it. But it wasn't, it wasn't. It didn't get hot enough and we were up in yeah. the mountains so it's cold you get like fermentation and then at night it gets cold so the fermentation dies we figure there's going to be a natural pasteurizing process and growing a similar microbe system that would be in a compost pile at around 120 degrees is when mm. you create the acetomycetes okay. and all the um, that's where tetracycline comes from mm -hmm. antibiotics come out of a, a compost at, mm -hmm. at around 120 there's something that happens in the pile mm -hmm. at that degree where there's like the acetomycetes fungus it forms and you can imagine there's a similar kind of process going on
yeah. in the fermentation of the chocolate where it's actually creating antibiotics. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because they're, they're trapped within the pod, so they don't yeah. necessarily get the benefit of having the yeast that um, like an apple does when it gets pressed. Yeah. That's just right on the skin or, or grapes, for example, mm -hmm. they're loaded with yeast. Yeah. The cacao doesn't really have that, but it does have the benefit of of being in the jungle, so you get lots of heat and warmth, and there's going to be bacteria and microbiotic growth, yeah. you know, activity. But then they also usually layer it with bananas, banana leaves. So they top it with banana leaves. The banana leaves have have a lot of of the of the yeast and the bacteria that are in the air. And then they sometimes even put the pods, the shells, like right in the fermentation. Oh yeah. Yeah, and then they'll cover it up with sacks and let it heat mm -hmm. up. They're also against the wood that's probably yeah. fermented many other boxes. Yeah. So you need these special wooden boxes that that are made without any nails. I know you all in, in Maine up here, I feel like you're experts with, with woodworking without nails. <laughs> I think my whole house was built with no nails, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, a contagious fear of fastening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, we are going to uh, go into the kitchen here shortly and actually watch your magic. and. <laughs> watch the, the process of, of making some chocolate. Is that right? Absolutely. And I think, is it, uh, are we gonna get lead in there in song? Is that what's gonna happen? <laughs> you guys wanna take us, you guys wanna take us home? To the kitchen? Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I really like the taste of that beer. Really yeah. yeah, these ones, they got like two different ones here. Which region are these from? This is all from Cusco. I got a couple inside from a different region. These ones, I is this the same one? Yep. That's yeah, really okay. Really nice when it dries like that purple like that. Well, that's what I look for when I want to bring really? the chocolate in. Yeah. Because there's no white running mm -hmm. through. A little bit of light brown. It's kind of like a body. <laughs> Well, you can see too, that purple is actually like a Venus in Western Africa. So, Matteo brought a gang with him. And here we have the lovely Venus and the lovely Wasi. And they are going to shower us with some beautiful sounds. Mm -hmm. Well, the cacao um, is also a medicine for the heart. Um, it is like a vasodilator, which means it's, it helps the blood flow to the heart. And um, it also helps open the heart. And um, kind of really widely recognized as a heart medicine. So this is a song about our heart being, and, and showing us the way of like the mystery of life and trusting that path and when we open ourselves to the path of our own hearts we open um, ourselves um, and are beginning to trust in the mystery of life so. beautiful oh, okay. mm -hmm. hey uh mateo you want to hand her, your mic down here yeah and we can just kind of yeah, have it in between you guys or you can set that on your lap or something that'll be fine yeah, over right here. Whoops. I can, can I clip this on here? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. My hair is clipping. Let's see. Okay, then I'm going to Oh, 
from Ecuador. A grandmother over there made that song, wrote that song. Oh, wow. And where did you learn it? From her through the internet. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Kitty wants to join. Do cats eat chocolate? No. I know dogs can't have it. So the, the, the major alkaloid in cacao, which is the theo, theobromine, uh, which is cacao is theobroma cacao, the fruit of the gods. The theobromine is very similar in, in its structure to caffeine. And that's what Wasi was talking about, the vasodilating properties. Mm -hmm. It opens up the blood vessels and allows whatever you're consuming with the cacao, especially if it has the cocoa butter, the fat, to absorb into the system, into the body. So that's why it's always... Always great to have the cacao with herbs. Sacred medicines mm -hmm. is really nice. And so that theobromine is actually not able to be metabolized by a lot of animals. Mm -hmm. So that's why dogs usually have problems with cacao because they can't metabolize the theobromine and you know it over over excites the system. Is it that they can't metabolize it or is it that it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, it's an MOI? And it might be causing like an overload of serotonin in the system. I don't mm -hmm. know. I've heard about the, yeah. the metabolization of yeah. it, but it might, that, that might mean? be a yeah. similar pro. Uh, and maybe yeah. maybe you're describing exactly what's what's going on there. Right? It's, yeah, it's also uh, really strongly antibacterial. Uh, it comes up in the research around teeth decay. Like it's mm. it's really strong against uh, the spirochetes that eat teeth and cause cavities. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And They've that, actually that. done studies in yeah. France where even eating high sugar chocolate, people that eat that have significantly less cavities yeah. than people that don't eat chocolate. Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm what sold. What do you think about the antimine <laughs> that was being a, a contributing, you know, force in the potency of the chocolate? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't, it's so complex, there's so yeah. much going on there that, 
you know, to pull out any of the specific, mm -hmm. you know, constituents and components is, you know, there's clearly activity there on, on many levels. And yeah. I don't know how many, you know, chemicals or alkaloids or constituents are really in the cacao, but, you know, I'm sure they they all kind of play, play a role yeah. on a physiological level, but also in that energetic, emotional level of kind of op opening and relaxing and mm -hmm. bringing, bringing a bit of release of tension in the emotional, yeah. in the emotional body. I think there's been some studies in recent years around andamine being a uh, cannabinoid and how it helps hemp and other cannabinoids absorb more efficiently and be more active mm. and different healing benefits. And that's, that's, you find that on the, specifically on the skin or within the cacao bean? Within the cacao bean itself, I think, yeah. but d definitely in the skin. Yeah, it, it's considered the joy hormone. We we make it in mm -hmm. in states of joy and right, ecstasy, right. and that's it. Hmm. Yeah, and it's traditionally been used along with other medicines that in yeah. Mesoamerica. You know, I was told by a friend that basically before they ingest other medicine, the cacao is kind of the opening to that doorway. Yeah, and it kind of allows that that process to unfold in a, in a really smooth way mm -hmm. and yeah yeah like bringing you home into your heart like it there's this one story about gordon watson felt like he found the the real authentic medicine lady when she served him the cacao beans first mm. there you go Transmission is coming to you from deep in the jungles of Central Maine. You've been listening to High on Spirit.